Well, hello everybody and welcome to one of our first online investigations into the pieces that we're playing. I'm delighted to be here with David Larkin. David Larkin is Senior Lecturer in Musicology at the University of Sydney based at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music. And we met via phone call um, as part of Andrew Ford's The Music Show. And it was such a delight to talk to somebody who obviously is so passionate about Beethoven and knows so much about Beethoven that we immediately thought that we had to get David on to delve into one of our favourite pieces, Beethoven's Opus 32. David, thank you so much for being part of this crazy idea to have an online investigation into Beethoven's 132. Thank you so much, Zoe. I'm just delighted to be here and to talk a little bit about Opus 132. Maybe we should start by just giving the, um, the, the, the viewer a chance just to sort of know where this quartet is coming from. So it was written in 1825, so basically within two years of Beethoven's untimely death. Um, and as such, it forms one of the five last quartets, which I don't need to tell you um, are among the greatest quartets of all time. They are profound. They are profoundly unsettling works. Um, and of course, they are all very different works from each other in emotional tone, in what they're trying to do musically, and in basic things like the number of movements. So maybe we could begin by just talking a little bit about what do you think makes Opus 132 special for you and different perhaps from the other late quartets of Beethoven. You know, the, the last main movement being so much fun. I think that the end of 131, the C-sharp minor, that the last movement is actually, you know, quite exhausting and gruelling. Whereas the last movement of the 132, there's such exuberance and such joy in there. And that, that's always, uh, that's always a, lo a lot of fun. But really we were talking about as a quartet about how so much of it being in a minor sits really well under our fingers and so as performers it just feels really nice to play there's a couple a couple of awkward bits for all of us um but it's not it's not like some of the other harder keys like c sharp is, is such c sharp minor is such a hard key to play so whether or not beethoven was considering the performers and the comfort of performers i suspect not but <laughs> but you know that that is definitely I think one of the reasons why for all of us for all string players you know we quite unanimously say 132 is our favourite. Right, <clears throat> I'm in incredibly in, in agreement with you when you say that it's the middle movement that kind of makes this quartet, and that for me is a little unusual in Beethoven. Like his slow movements are wonderful, don't get me wrong, but very often with his quartets we have a feeling that the weight is either at the front, like for example the first Razumovsky. I feel that that first movement is such an epic thing that everything after that is in its shadow, or mm -hmm. else like Opus 130, the first version of it, the weight is at the end with that big grosso fuga. Whereas yeah. for Opus 132, it's the heart of the quartet, is the middle of the five movements, movement number three. Um, and yeah. when you're talking about the instrumentalists as well, uh, one of the things I was reading, and I'd be interested in your perspective, is that apparently it was written for a benefit concert for the cellist of the Schupanzig Quartet. And it was supposedly a concertante work for the cellist. Do you feel that you get even more of the limelight than perhaps you would normally expect as a cello, cellist playing Beethoven? No. Do you know, and that, that's the first time I'd heard that story. Um, look, the, the, the last movement, maybe, but, you know, it's the, in the last movement, the cello sort of, the cello tune is very quickly doubled by the first violin. So it's not, that's, that's really interesting. I, I mean, look, potentially, you know, the, the cello starts. That, you know, that, that, that starts, starts the whole kind of canonic fugal entry. Mm. I'm going to view this piece very differently now. I want to go back and play it again as if it was a conscious contact with the cello. I mean, it's very fair to say that that might have been in the planning stages. It, uh, certainly the, yeah. the, the result is very much equal. All instruments seem to be participating in a very free and equal fashion there. Well, let's, I think, start focusing in on the individual movements of this five movement quartet. So this, um, in order of composition, is the second of the late five quartets that Beethoven writes, even though by number it's called number 15, which makes it the second last. So it makes it the fourth, or it seems to be the fourth there. And Beethoven originally 
planned a four movement quartet, but as what we've ended up with is a five movement quartet. So we'll take through movements in turn. Now, I want to start by talking a little bit about something that musicologists get very excited about, which is motifs. And there's one motif that Beethoven gets obsessed with, particularly in his late works, but indeed throughout his whole career. So I'm going to start with somebody who's not Beethoven, and that is Bach. Bach famously had a musical cipher. He had a way of spelling out his name. So let's listen to that. So that gnarly little figure, um, if you use the German names for notes, spells out B, a, C, H. So Bach, in other words, has a musical equivalent of his name. The thing I'd like to point out about that is the fact that there are two semitone pairs in that motif. Now, Beethoven has a motif that is similar to, but also different from the Bach motif. I was reading yesterday, someone called it the Bach motif, and I was like, not exactly. So let's just see where this motif comes from. So we're going to start off with a harmonic minor scale. And the bit I'm concerned about are the last four notes of the scale. Now, those four notes in various different orderings become Beethoven's obsession, particularly in the last quartets. Again, let me point out the fact, the similarity to Bach is that we also have two pairs of semitones in this four note uh, grouping. Now, so let's have a little look at a few pieces by Beethoven. First of all, we've got the opening of the A minor quartet, which we're going to hear in a little moment, so I won't say any more about that yet, except to point out that the cello has those four notes in a different ordering, seven, eight, six, five. So we'll hear that in a moment. Now, another very famous piece from the last quartets, though technically detached from them, is the Grosse Fuga, originally the finale for Opus 130. And this one has, again, that same intervallic pattern. It's not really behaving as six, five, seven, eight in a minor key, but the same intervallic pattern can be found within that. And we might just pause to hear that example. <laughs> And now, um, the C-sharp minor quartet, which you mentioned earlier in that awkward key, begins off with yet another statement of those four notes. So the fact that he begins with it shows how important it is for him. In this case, it's five, seven, eight, six in that ordering. And last but not least, in a quartet where you wouldn't think to find it because it feels like it's a much lighter piece, the uh, F major, the last quartet he writes, you have it kind of, sort of, in between two parts here. You get the eight and seven in the viola, and then a flat six and five. Even in a major key piece, he can make it work there. So let's now turn to the beginning of our A minor quartet and look at how this is deployed. Then. So first of all, let's listen to the opening motif played by the cello. Now that figure I'm going to call motif X. Could be called anything, could be called B-A-C-H, but let's call it motif X. So this four note figure is one of the most important ingredients in the first movement in particular. You can see it, it's found in the first violin when that comes in, that plays it. A little bit later the cello restates it again in different keys, different times. But it's not the only appearance of this motif because we've got something quite exciting. Let's look at what the viola plays in bars three to four. That figure is motif X, but upside down. Now I tried to sort of see what the best way of explaining this was, so I have a little diagram. So if the shape of motif X is like this, so a little up, a big jump, and then back down again, when you see the inversion of it, it's going exactly in the opposite direction. So watch the two of them as they mirror each other. So that's the way this motif X prime or X in inversion is used. And that's played by the cello, again, after the viola, and then by the first violin. So again, this opening is extremely concentrated on these four notes. So when you're playing this opening, what is the kind of the emotional realm that you're trying to get to? Do you know, it's, it's the, the starkness of the opening and those semitones. Semitones always evoke an emotional response. And, um, you know, it was, we played this opening so many different tempi. 
so many different um, sound colours, so many, so many different ways. And in terms, and like all great music, if you if you strip it away and just play what's what's there, it's it's completely. Um, that's absolutely enough. And one thing that we did realise from this opening is that it's cut common, not not four four. So so over the course of recording it, actually in a basically what started off as a mistake of starting off too quickly, and and I'm like, oh sorry 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 that was too quick. Actually, then I can't remember who it was. I actually, I quite like it. And that's when we sort of in a quickly five minutes we totally reshaped how we thought this opening should go in that it needs to be felt um, in that minimum pace, not in, um, not in sort of some um, sort of uh, time standing still way. Not that any way is correct or, um, or wrong, but actually that was, that, was, that was quite revelatory for us in terms of, you know, what clues has Beethoven put on there to guide us in terms of how we how we move forward in the relationship as well. So many performers talk about the relationship between the SI sostenuto tempo and the allegro tempo. Absolutely. Um, I'm very happy that there was a, it was a lovely accident that got you onto the right track for this yeah. particular thing. And of course, this is the moment when you have the absolute responsibility as the cellist. <laughs> Nobody's going to give you the tempo. As soon as you've set those first two notes, nothing can change after that there. But yes, when I listen to this um, in recordings, um, I generally feel that it's so tense and drawn out that it's almost like by the time you get to the end there, an explosion has to happen. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just stasis and an explosion does happen. And we move into the Allegro. Now, a slow introduction before an Allegro, very typical, of course, of a lot of pieces in sonata form, as we know. However, in this case, we're not finished with those motifs, that motif X. We're going to come back to it in a moment. But let's first of all look at the main theme of the first movement of the quartet in A minor, as you'd expect a main theme to be. Um, and in this case, we have this particular figure, which I'm going to call motif Y, just for the sake of saying something about it. It's an arch-shaped melody, which Beethoven actually loves arch-shaped melodies in this quartet. So like, da -da -dee 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 -dee. Um, and then it is, expanded upon by the first violin. The first violin's like, yeah, okay, thanks cello, you did it quite nicely, but let me take it to a nicer conclusion there. And then that's what we have up here. However, within that motif Y, there is still those four notes of motif X. They are found just in here. So just to make it a little larger, um, I put it up here in bigger notes. Um, and basically what we have there is the four notes in a different ordering, eight, seven, six, five. So that introductory motif, instead of being separate from the rest of the quartet, is embedded within a lot of the thematic movings and a lot of the uh, larger structural movements of this first movement particular. So yes, so that is where you find it. But again, as soon as you start looking, and this is where you sort of turn into somebody sort of slightly insane trying to find cryptograms, you can find it everywhere. Look, for example, at what happens if you look at the accompanying parts, <laughs> accompanying parts, the uh, supporting parts here. Second violin and viola. The second violin is going G sharp A, seven, eight. The viola is going E, F, five, six, five, six, seven, eight. Um, and yes, you can end up sort of like tearing your hair out. It's so complex. Did Beethoven mean all this? Does it matter if he didn't? Those relationships are there. This motif X really does run through things. So if you know Motif X and Motif Y, you will have a very good sense of what this quartet's first movement is asking you to play with. There are other themes, of course there are, but they often seem to come out of or in some way relate to them. I just thought I'd show um, and maybe listen to potentially um, a little of the second theme, which is one of the most glorious, um, relaxing things. The first theme is more tense and edgy. The second theme is glorious and relaxing. Um, and this particular theme is also smooth and arch shaped. So again, you have a very smooth theme, which he seems to like to counterbalance the angularity of motif X. Now, I think the bit that we wanted to talk about, Zoe, was late on in this quartet when we have, um, it's coming towards the end and Beethoven is getting things more and more compressed and what he does with the motifs is great. So up at the top there, we've got motif Y, coming back again in a kind of coda-like fashion there. So you can see it stated there, then repeated and sequenced. So he's really working that one hard. And of course, we've already seen that within Motif Y, we've got those four notes of Motif X, but that's not all. 
Let's listen to a special example that we've put together and looking at the longest and you would think least interesting notes in these four bars. Let's listen to it. I think you know where I'm going with this. Here we've got Motif X, distributed almost like it's Arnold Schoenberg or Webern doing what they do with motifs. We get six, we get the five, we get the seven, and we get the eight. It's embedded, it's supporting motif Y as never before, as the actual harmonic foundations. And again, maybe this is what musicologists get really thrilled about, but actually turning it to you, Zoe, do you find, because you play the first and last notes of that, is that something that you were bringing out or thought to bring out, or are you much more involved in the overall impetus of motif Y at this stage? We definitely are conscious of that at that point in time. And the way we choose to play those notes, um, you'll see that we choose to do them with very little vibrato so that the texture, they'll stand out from the texture. And it also then gives you a kind of subconscious reminder of that's how we played it in the opening but yeah de de definitely and you know there's so much going on at that point in time you may not re recognize it consciously but subconsciously it will be there absolutely it's been well drilled into our subconscious by this stage or into our conscious as well and again i thought there was something that that we might want to talk about um, in this particular piece because you've said already a minor is quite um, a happy key for string players there but there are some deliberate decisions you've got to make about how you still play in A minor. Do you want to talk a little bit about the ending there and the technical challenges this involves or the technical decisions it involves for, I think, the second violinist here? Absolutely. So if you look at the second violin um, part, which is the second one along, um, Wilma was was trying to decide, you know, does she, with, all, with the semiquaves, she has the option of string crossing or playing um, playing it on one string and we we did an example of both versions which we will play now so you can clearly hear that little decision one of hundreds but just as an example of um, the countless decisions that we make in order to evoke some kind of emotional response I mean, it's fascinating because clearly, of course, the viola and cello there can happily do that, in fact, have to do that on one string there. And then at the very end, Beethoven has asked the first violin to swap strings. You can see with that very odd notation of the E's, it's a stopped and, and an open E. So therefore, both possibilities are in the ear, in the air. So yeah, I'll be very interested to see which decision was taken in the final performance. All right, so let's leave the first movement behind with its motivic tautness and move to the second movement, which is considerably lighter in feel there. So I'd just like to talk a little bit about rhythm in the second movement and then um, ask you what you were doing about some, some of those things, how the performing decisions um, played out. So first of all, we've got this theme, which is, um, it's sort of set up with one bar ideas. So all the instruments are playing in unison. So I'll just put a little box around it. So clearly a one bar idea repeated um, in many parts, continuing and it continues. And then on top of that, we've got a two bar idea laid on top. Etc. So therefore, very clearly aligned with bars or with two bar units. Now, that's Beethoven setting us up, and we have a very strong sense of one, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three. We feel those phrases, we feel the rhythms. But what happens as we go on, as we're getting further into the quartet? Beethoven still, of course, is using those same ideas. So there you get the two bar idea, here you get the one bar idea, everything again fitting within bars, which is great. But then things go off the rails deliberately. Beethoven is having fun. This is a scherzo-like movement. Look at this little figure there. That detaches itself and then starts being worked. And look at the fact it's not fitting within a bar anymore. This is on a three, one, two feel to it. And then Beethoven says, oh, I really like that idea. Let me keep working it. And look how many of them there are. Done, three, one, two, three, one, two. And that, that's really sort of tilting us away from one, two, three to a three, one, two grouping. Then look at the cello part along here. We start getting a three, one, two figure as well. 
And again, Beethoven really runs with that. 312, 312, 312, 312, all the way along. And ultimately, I feel, as an analyst and someone who's listened to it a lot but not played it, I feel that what Beethoven is doing is he's taken this and just really shifted the bar line so that after a while, I'm hearing it, the 312 as a 123, 123, 123, which is, of course, off from how it looks but maybe how it feels. Now, I know that performers can either go with this new organization or actively work against it. Which did you go for, Sarah? Um, it's, this was one of the funniest um, discoveries of our day of recording because we, 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 um, we recorded the piece in its entirety and then we recorded the little examples for, um, for this discussion. And it was so funny because previously we had been kind of sticking to the bar line, the idea that actually if the listener and kind of leaving it up to the listener, if the listener wants to get confused, they can get confused. If the listener wants to still feel that nice first downbeat that hasn't been displaced, they can choose to listen to it. So kind of slightly ambiguous sitting on the fence. And that was a conscious decision because we believe in the listener being active and not passive. But um, when we purposefully, and you'll hear the, um, perhaps actually now would be a good point to pause and have a listen to the two versions. Um, the first being with the bar line in its correct place, where it appears on the page. And then the second version being purposefully displacing the bar line and so that it's orally confusing. result of that little experiment and us pushing the boundaries with what we felt comfortable we've decided that the next time we play it um, we're going to purposefully displace the bar line and get everybody confused so that was because we we enjoy that sensation so much and, and it's like anything it's when you come out of that discomfort that you kind of go hey that was sort of fun like going on a roller coaster when, once you stop then it's fun absolutely i love the idea that these last pieces, you don't, never really come to a final decision. You just have the latest decision and it's always open to reinterpretation depending on what you decide you want to bring out the next time there. And yes, I must say when I listen to it, I always get tripped and somehow I end up on the wrong bar, parts of the bar and then I have an extra beat and I'm like, where did that come from? And of course, this is Beethoven having fun, which is what a scherzo movement should do. So just jumping over the trio section there, just to mention that it is, um, by contrast, very simple rhythmically, very simple harmonically. It's Beethoven kind of imitating what we call the musette style, a kind of like a bagpipe-like drone. As you can see, look at the way viola and cello have, I would have to say, not the most interesting parts along here. That's not their function. They're providing, as I say, a drone-like accompaniment. And then you have this lyrical melody um, in the first violin, um, and then a lot of sort of like string crossings again for the second violin, just to amplify hey. it. David, we, we were wondering, just with this bit, we were wondering if Beethoven had been influenced by a hurdy-gurdy at some stage. It's possible. As far as I'm aware, um, he actually took this idea from a, a German dance that he had written about 25 years earlier. Right. Um, but yes, I think in a way it could be the hurdy-gurdy. It could also be just the pastoral idiom more generally. But I like the hurdy-gurdy suggestion there. Did you try and bring out a sort of a hurdy-gurdy-ish effect? Whenever we, uh, whenever we tried to do it too much, then it just became, yeah, no, again, it was, it was a subtle thing. And, and sometimes it's enough just to think it. Absolutely. Yeah. I, think, I think, yeah, this, this, I, this always feels like after the fun of the skirt, so this feels like it should be just transparently sort of like floating and dreamlike. That's, that's my non-performer impression there. And then, of course, we go back to the skirt, so more rhythmic fun. And then we come to the, by far, the most important mo movement in this quartet. The reason that it's got the nickname it has, Heiliger Dank Gesang. So let's, first of all, talk a little bit about this. 
Beethoven got ill during the composition of this piece. Um, it interrupted his composition. And um, in his uh, conversation book around about May or June, he wrote, hymn of thanksgiving to God of an invalid on his convalescence, feeling of new strength and reawakened feeling. Now, very closely, we have this as the actual title or expressive instruction for this movement. So the translation that you see in red is of the text that's presented both in German and in Italian here, but um, I think English is probably easier for most people. Now, so as you can see, holy song and the divinity, Gottheit. So clearly this is a movement that is something of a prayer. So Beethoven was a man of faith, um, not an orthodox believer by any manner of means, but he definitely did have a strong sense of the divinity. And what I find remarkable about this movement is um, so many things. Let me just first of all point out the last words, which I have yet to mention, in the Lydian mode. Now, the Lydian mode, <laughs> kind of had had its day and was more or less at an end in the 17th century. Here's Beethoven at the beginning of the 19th century revivifying this older modal thing. And I think that's because he wants to convey an antique atmosphere here. Again, he's also writing in styles, as I hopefully will show you, that kind of recall older religious music. So let's just have a little look at the first line of this piece. So first of all, you get this motif, a different motif, we haven't encountered it before, repeated by each of the instruments in turn. Okay, the cello, sorry, only gets a couple of notes before it's interrupted, but nonetheless, this motif is repeated. Now, this motif isn't used in the next part there, so it's not like a fugue, even though it is imitative. We might say that this is what we call a point of imitation. And this is basically how people like Palestrina or Lassus in the 16th century would have structured their music around points of imitation. So again, echoing an older way of composing. But when the cello is interrupted, we have another glorious passage. In the Lydian mode, so a lot of B naturals instead of the B flats you'd expect of a piece based on F, but in a style that recalls another religious type. And this is very clearly a chorale style. Um, Zoe, I was wondering, when it comes to performing this, how slowly do you dare to go with this particular piece? It's marked molto adagio, but of course, it has ultimately got to move. How did you negotiate forward motion and the static quality that the music has to have as well? Do you know, it's interesting that you talk about um, that word chorale, and it's something that we um, really wanted to feel like it, would, it could be something that we could potentially sing. And something that, so we are on the faster side. And I forget, you know, because there's a whole thing in, it's like a badge of honour, this movement, and you look at all the different recordings, are you on the 17 minute end of it? 17 and a half sometimes, or are you on the 15, 15 and a half minute? I think we come in just under 16 minutes. So, you know, it's like we're, we are on the, on, the faster, on the faster side, not that it's a race long or short. <laughs> But but what but it was in but it um but we did want to have the sense that there was a line and that there was a tune that it, that, that that was our reasoning behind that. Having said that, some of our favourite recordings that we listen to as a quartet in our preparation are really incredibly slow, and have that have that timeless quality. Um, and also, we did prepare something that I didn't tell you about, David, but we might pause now because Wilma volunteered to give a little slight demonstration about the Lydian mode. She used to be in the Lydian quartet and she informed us that, in fact, it was a feminine mode. So this is Wilma giving her um, demonstration of um, F major and then the Lydian mode with the B natural. That's wonderful because I hadn't done a slide on the Lydian mode. So fantastic that oh, that compliments it so, so, so happily and accidentally. So yeah. we have this slow music three in three separate iterations during this, court, this, this movement, interspersed with contrasting music. And the music is quite the contrast. I'm not even going to sort of go too, into too much detail here, just to say that this is how Beethoven represented feeling new life. And everything changes, everything changes. 
the time, the, the speed changes, the tempo marking changes, the time signature changes, the key changes, and the feeling changes. This is one of the most joyous. If the first section is holy and reverential, this second section really does feel like just a, an old person smiling in the sunshine for me. It's just gloriously happy. And there's a lot of activity, though it never really sounds too energetic to me. Again, performing decision-wise, um, what were you talking about when you came to the, the contrast in sections here? We, we would, um, and it's interesting that you use the words reverential and joy because we were using those same words. And, and for us, whether, you know, these decisions also um, are subjective to how we're feeling at the time. And this is the first piece well, one of the first pieces that we'd um, rehearsed since lockdown with the four, you know, the, our four members. And so we were incredibly joyful um, and very keen to sort of err on the kind of more joyful, faster side of Tempe taken. Absolutely. I, I think this, this year of all years, we can all appreciate the idea of being sort of separate from the world and then re returning to the world as Beethoven himself did. Again, I wanted to look at the very last iteration of the first music. So just to remind you, we had our point of imitation and we had our chorale because Beethoven's doing something a little different this time. So we get a point of imitation that is a kind of like a rhythmically altered version of that original point of imitation. So still a very similar sort of um, theme there. And again, as a point of imitation, it passes through, in this case, three instruments. Um, and then the first violin will play it in a moment, but let's leave that. So remember then, it should be followed by the chorale. Beethoven doesn't have the chorale with every part moving together like he did the first time. This time, he has just the first five notes, the same ones that we see here, and they are treated fugally. So it's as if the point of imitation idea, the idea of imitation, has now invaded the chorale. So you can see it's then imitated by second part time by the viola, third time by the cello, and fourth time by the first violin, all at the same time as the point of imitation is continuing. So effectively what Beethoven's doing is he had point of imitation and chorale alternating earlier on. Now he's synthesizing them both. And it is just so emotively impactful, this particular music. Um, Absolutely amazing, amazing piece there. So yes, as you can see, the points of imitation are continuing, continuing, etc. All right, with reluctance, we should leave the third movement and go on to the fourth movement, which is the shortest and weirdest of the quartet, I think we'd agree. Um, again, I don't know if this is just my defective hearing, but I remember when I first heard this quartet, I couldn't lock into the rhythm of this first part there. I kept hearing it as a three, four sort of scherzo-like thing. I've actually even written out what I think I heard, and I think Beethoven is slightly trying to get us to hear this. So I hear it as, dun, dun, one, two, three, e one, two, rest. Three, e one, two, three, e one, two. Now, as you can see, Beethoven doesn't want this. It's a march. And ultimately, I think the fact that he puts the accent on the second beat is what led me astray as a listener there. Is this something that um, the quartet ever considered, or is this just me and my, my rhythmic problems, which I need to, to, to sort out myself? It's, you know, it's, again, it was one of those things that when I put it to the quartet, um, in terms of that we might think of it this way, based on its, and, and that they'd all, for, for all of them, it was um, quite, uh, quite a shift to actually th think of it out of a march and in 4-4. But that said, um, that said, I think that, you know, practising it sort of in the, in the way that you've rewritten it and with that idea, I do think that, it, that that really actually kind of helped us change um, our view and most importantly, have a lot more fun with this movement. Good. I think absolutely this movement is, is, is a fun march, no matter which way you, you, you hear it ultimately. And then it keeps going. It's a very short movement and then everything changes. Zoe, what do you make of this final section, these last three systems of the movement? What do you make of them? Do you know, I think that these, um, we were talking earlier about how it's these three staves potentially have the most radical decisions that performers can make within these three staves. Um, I think we've, and we've got a couple of examples um, showing the different ways that performers could go. The first being, um, if we have a look at the third bar and the slashes 
over some of those notes and what that would normally mean to performers. Um, some quartets, in fact, probably most quartets, will play those as tremolo, which means that the bow just goes as, as fast as we can. We don't even, there's so fast, there's no note value for it. Um, but actually, um, Wilma pointed out, she said, well, actually, if I look at that, I want to play semiquavers. If I look at that as a performer, and um, so we, we, we give everything a go. Um, and the reason that Wilma was the one to point it out was that if you have a look at the beginning of the second stave, Beethoven's actually written out semiquavers for the second violin. And so, but the thing is that normally, um, normally the sort of getting the semiquavers together with the internal parts is so tricky. We didn't even really try. So what we've got for you are two versions. I think the first version is tremolo, and then the second version is with the semiquavers. And uh, look at it. So, so we do perform this with with semiquavers in this in this passage. Um, and look at the, the other one. Other sort of uh, tricky thing is to reconcile getting into um, this recitative operatic section, and you know what the time what the time relationship is going to be. So again, we've got two versions for you. One where we almost go double tempo and quite fast. And another one where we keep the same tempo, but just, you know, sort of go Pio, Pio Allegro. And um, so here are those two, those two versions. I just I know that when we come back to perform this again that these the most fun we are going to have is in changing those ideas and changing the way we do it there's so much scope in those three staves absolutely that's and this is fascinating because you know I think I'd only ever heard the tremolo version I had never heard the the, the more measured semi-quaver version so this is it's it's really exciting for me to be able to sort of rehear this passage in a new fashion there and I'm really glad you mentioned the word recitative because this is such operatic music slash you know you can hear sort of like a dramatic soprano and um, doing her thing there and of course Beethoven has had operatic experience but more particularly he brings the vocal sensibility into his instrumental music. Maybe um, the second last piano sonata is a very clear case where you have sort of things notated as recitative and very clearly the same effect here. And then we move into the final movement, um, which I think as you've already said, is one of the most fun things to play. It is definitely hugely fun to listen to. It's not like Beethoven is sort of like reaching a culmination point. It's a, a sort of finale you might say is, a relaxant finale. We've, we've been through our, you know, stillness and convalescence. We've had fun with the march and now we're just able to just have a rollicking good time in this final movement there. Again, I don't have very much to say about it. Again, you've got these lovely sort of arch-shaped melodies. The so again, that beautiful curve to the music there. Um, and then again, the first violin sort of um, taking over and then having bring it to a gorgeous conclusion around here. There is a few other things, however, that I think you want to talk about, Zoe. Um, and these are, again, things as a performer you would be hugely conscious of. And I, as a listener, was happily able to leave it to the performers to do. So can you talk to me about this col punto d'arco, which you see, first of all, in the lower two instruments, and then in, this is towards the very end of the movement, and then in the first and second violins? Yes, yeah, so that, that means at the tip of the bow, that instruction means to do at the point or at the, at the tip of the bow. Um, not, not many, I'm, I'm, I, I am yet to find um, a recording where they, where I've heard it. Um, I'm sure there, there must be one because, you know, as we kept on saying, so we get to it and it's, it's, it's very awkward in actual fact. 
because it's fast and he's written Kyle's on every single note, so which, which means basically sort of very short and that every note needs to be sort of as important as the last one. So really there's sort of, there, there's mixed messages there. And we, in the end, so we, again, we've got two different versions. So first of all, we've got the version where we're in the lower part of the bow, where it's more logic, actually more logical to play. And, um, and then we've got the second version, which is, which is at the tip of the bow. see that the, the the tip it's it's awkward but it's also really 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 fun and so again we decided to have fun with it and to sort of celebrate the awkwardness um as we kind of steamrolled through to the end and it certainly wouldn't be beyond beethoven to write awkwardly for strings on purpose <laughs> and so so the fact that we have this at the end there it's sort of like well why not there yeah. Well, so yeah, so hopefully this will have given the, um, the listeners and viewers a chance just to get to know some of the aspects of this quartet. I mean, an in-depth study would take many more hours than we've got time here for. But thank you for your attention. Thank you for inviting me, Zoe, to be part of this discussion there. And I hope some of the musicological or analytical insights I provided will be able to be um, sort of built on as you listen to this piece, because they definitely find their justification in a performance. Thank you so much, Dave. And I'm just really, I mean, your insights have really informed the way we're going to play it next time. And I'm so um, looking forward to potentially talking with you about Beethoven's Opus 131, which is part of our 2021 season. Um, it's a joy talking to you, David, and to have all of your immense knowledge. Thank you so much for taking us up on this challenge. Thank you very much. And thank you all for listening to us both. Enjoy the performance. <laughs>